All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. Uh, it's MC Owens, and it's Sunday night. And so we're going to talk about a sutra. Um, but actually, what we're going to talk about tonight, let me give you tonight's theme. So the theme for tonight is, it, it's funny. The theme for tonight, I guess, is samsara. And I would say that the theme for tonight is reincarnation. And in a way, I want to talk about that idea, the idea of reincarnation. And I guess I want to start off tonight by basically asking the question, is reincarnation a good translation of samsara? And that'll lead us to basically the question, well, what is samsara? And then we're going to talk about what samsara is. So that's the theme for tonight. But so you can kind of think of it as being about reincarnation, because we're going to be talking about different paths of rebirth. So that's what the sutra is talking about tonight. So it's going to be talking about the different ways one could be reborn. And so I thought, oh, well, this will be a great night to talk about kind of everybody's favorite topic, which is, is there reincarnation in Buddhism? Or like, what's the deal with re like, what's going on? So we're gonna have a great conversation about all of that. Um, I'll start off tonight actually by just saying a few words about the idea of reincarnation. Um, you know, I don't know where you stand on the topic of reincarnation, but I'll tell you that it's, a, it's an idea like reincarnation, I'd say, that is something that kind of what interested me very early on in life. Not like when I was really young, but you know, like in my teenage years, I started, you know, thinking about <clears throat> different things. And I still remember sort of some trace ideas that I had in my teenage years. But the idea basically was about how you know, some people talk about going to heaven. <laughs> some people talk about there not being any such thing as heaven. And when I was a teenager, I learned about these whole other cultures, whole other religions that think about reincarnation. And what interested me as a young person wasn't even so much about heaven or reincarnation what i was interested in was wait we haven't figured this out yet <laughs> like here i am growing up you know it's in the 90s the 1990s and i basically was interested in i didn't have a word for it at the time i was still you know in high school basically i would later come to understand or be given a word that I was interested in worldviews, what, what the Buddhist or what in Indian philosophy they would call a drishti, a drishti, a worldview. Where do we come from and where do we go? And so, again, I wasn't really so interested in figuring out who was right. Even in my teenage years, I kind of understood that it was more complex than that. But what I was really interested in was kind of like why people believe what they believe and what are people's deep seated belief structures. And so I went into studying philosophy when I first went to college. I didn't know <laughs> that you could study religion academically. Like I only knew about going to Bible school and I didn't even go to church. I didn't go to Bible study, but I had a, I had a friend of mine as a kid who went to Bible study on Sundays. And so if I spent the night at his house on a Saturday, it meant I had to go to Bible study with him and his family on Sunday. Always something I weighed <laughs> about whether I should go spend the night at his house or not. But I had no real exposure to religion per se. And I certainly didn't know that you could study religion academically. So I studied philosophy for a while until I basically learned about 
uh, that you could major, or I actually had to wind up transferring. Uh, I won't bore you with my whole CV, but I had to transfer to a different college because I found out, oh, they have a program in religion where you can like study all the different religions. And that was the greatest thing I could ever have heard as a young person that, oh, wow, there a whole department where you can actually just study all the different religions and not like join them, like not become a Christian or a Buddhist or whatever, but actually just learn about them. Great. Sign me up. And that's what I did. That was my major in college was I was a religion major focusing on Eastern religion, Taoism and Buddhism were my primary interests in that way. And that's sort of what led me then further deeper into this path of, of studying Buddhism, eventually coming to basically understand or call myself a Buddhist in that sense, like teach it, I live it, I practice it, I extol it. So that's sort of that. But again, underneath that pursuit was sort of this interesting, just different belief structures. And just the, I kind of think now that I'm even speaking about it and thinking about it, I feel like I always approached it much more poetically that all these different people were just using different, beautiful, poetic language to talk about the same ideas or maybe different ideas. But again, I just wasn't really too interested in figuring out, you know, who had the truth, who was right in that way. And then, oh, I'll sign up and be that. I'll be a Christian if that's really true, you know, in that way. So Given that, I just wanted to provide everybody with a little bit of background about where I come, am coming from in that way. So now let's talk a little bit about reincarnation. I'm going to probably do this in a few different um, ways. I, I think I'm going to do the first pass at this. And we're just going to talk about reincarnation in a general sense. This is sort of like the you know, elementary school version of reincarnation, like just the real basics. So when I started taking courses in uh, hin what would be called Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, of course, you, one learns about that, that view of that drishti, that worldview, that in a sense, time isn't moving linearly, but time is moving cyclically. And so just like the seasons come and go and come and go cyclically, there's a sense in which the life is cyclical, not moving in an arrow towards some terminus, some to towards some end that might be called heaven or judgment day or whatever, you, again, whatever your poetry says in that way. But the poetry of India, in that sense, is about life going cyclically. And in general, of course, there's this idea, again, this is the elementary school version of this. But in, you know, there's this idea that maybe you were an animal in your past life and have been reborn as a human. And depending upon how you live this life, you could go on to be reborn in a better station of life, meaning bigger house, more wealth, more health, whatever. Or depending on how you play your cards, you might be reborn back as an animal kind of a thing. So this is, of course, the elementary school version of what would be called reincarnation. Here's the thing about that word reincarnation. When I was studying philosophy, when I was in college, I, as a philosophy person, I also became very interested in language. I became, I started studying all these different languages, Chinese and Japanese, Latin and Greek, all kinds of languages. And not only did I develop a sense of, of language in that way, but I also sort of became very aware of how 
important language is. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, the word reincarnation, it, it means something very literally. And if you know your Spanish, of course, you know what carne is, you know what carne is, the meat is the flesh. And so to reincarne, to reincarnate is actually to take on the flesh again. And as I just described, the elementary version of reincarnation, if we're talking about maybe being reborn as an animal or having once been an animal, yeah, that might be considered reincarnate or reincarnation. The problem in terms of looking at Indian philosophy or Buddhism, the problem is, is that of the various paths of rebirth that we're about to talk about, which number five, we're going to talk about the five paths of rebirth tonight, only two of them are in karne. Only two of the five paths of rebirth are in flesh. That's the animal realm and the human realm. But within the general framework of reincarnation, there are five paths of rebirth. The lowest path of rebirth is as a hell dweller. I'll say more about the hell realms in a moment, but the idea is, is that the lowest, worst place one could be reborn is in hell. <laughs> Next up from that is the realm of the, well, I'm going to give you the traditional order. The traditional order, the next up, is the realm of the preta, the, the ghost, specifically known as a hungry ghost. Now, a, a ghost is understood to be some kind of disembodied carne being. <laughs> so there is a kind of intimate relationship between even, even the human realm and the ghostly realm that the, the hungry ghosts are generally understood to be disembodied humans. They could be disembodied animals, but that's the general sense of a hungry ghost. Again, I'll, I'll say more about each of these realms, but we're just doing a quick pass. The next up from being a hungry ghost, if you played your karmic cards right, you could be reborn as an animal that now you've made it into the flesh, so to speak. Next up for being an animal is the human realm, which is where I assume most of us presume to find ourselves th this evening. And then the fifth realm is the realm of the devas, the realm of the gods. Now, these devas, these gods, even the word god might be a loaded term, so to speak. Um, but they are not in the flesh. They are not in carne. They do abide in a more, oh, by the way, this is understood in the elementary school version that we're telling right now. Hell, hell is down there and the heavenly realms are up there. It is a very, um, you know, vertically oriented system. Um, my feeling about that vertical orientation, even from my high school days, has always been the fact that we see and think <laughs> up here, and that actually if we saw and thought with our ass, heaven would be down there, probably. <laughs> but since we elevate and think thinking, and all of the immaterial is happening up here, then heaven must be further up there. And since the hell realms are usually associated with the base desires, with the, the fundamental desires, the hell realms are usually down there. Okay, so that's the, just the quick basis of the various possible paths of rebirth in a traditional cyclical view of life. Now, uh, I didn't say this, but I assume you understood 
already, I'm not really talking about the Buddhist worldview, the Buddhist view of reincarnation yet. Just talking about the general framework of reincarnation. Buddhists use this general framework, which is why I'm telling you the general framework. But when I get to the sutra, when we get to Buddhism, they're going to have a little bit of a slightly different understanding of these things. But in general, before Buddhism, before the Buddha, and still to this day in many, many traditions, the general sense of reincarnation is that there is in each sentient being, in you, in me, in a fly, in a, in a little microorganism, there is a, a soul of sorts. That soul or that essence is referred to as the Atman. The Atman, the way to understand the Atman is if we are talking about a cyclical view of life in which in the previous life, I may have been an animal, which means no beard, uh, no, no, unless I was a you know silverback gorilla or something, no walking upright. But what I'm getting at is, is that if this flesh, if these eyes, if these ears, if all of this is my human birth and I was once an animal, who, who or what was an animal and is now a human? Who or what is, is, is now has gone through that shift? Well, traditionally, they talk about the Atman. The Atman is the essence or the soul that is sort of bobbing and floating around through this cyclical process of birth, living, dying, rebirth, living, dying, rebirth. And it's the Atman that's undergoing the journey. Very simply, that's the basic idea. So let's talk, I want to give you a little bit more background about the world, the general worldview at the time of the Buddha. Like this is what was popular. This is what people were sort of were thinking about. And then the Buddha came along. And well, I just want to put it to you this way. The general view of these things is that being reborn as a hell dweller is the worst. It's the worst because it's the most torturous, the descriptions of these hell realms. And by the way, if you, you don't know, traditionally there's understood to be eight hot hells and eight cold hells. So in you know Catholic kind of Western theology, we only get hot hells, but in the Eastern tradition or in the, the Indian tradition, you get hot and cold hells. You're tortured incessantly. One of my favorite descriptions of one of the hell realms, it's one of the hot hell realms. <laughs> this will just give you a little bit of a, of a taste. And I, I apologize in advance for that, but a little taste of a particular hell realm. There's a hell realm, they say, in which there's this smoldering hot iron pole it's like so hot that if you were to touch it, you basically just incinerate. And there's this particular hell realm where the beings born in that hell realm have an uncontrollable desire when they are born in that hell realm to grab that hot iron pole. And they go, and they incinerate only to be reborn in that same exact hell realm. And when they are reborn, they grab the pole again and are incinerated. And it goes on like that incessantly 
for lifetimes after lifetimes after lifetimes. Or you could be reborn in a sea of urine. You could be, I mean, it gets terrible. You could be born in situations where you're being drawn and quartered, right? Torn in part. It's terrible. It's a hell realm. So that's the worst. <clears throat> now, the next up from that is this preta realm the realm of hungry ghosts. And the thing about hungry ghosts is, um, actually, I've just, I, I'm just i gonna do this a slightly differently so it doesn't take quite as long. Regarding the hell realm, one of the things that I wanna start setting up tonight is, let's see, I should, I should stick to my plan and just do it a little quicker, so. The hungry ghost realm, it's all about this insatiable desire. It, it's an unquenchable, unslakeable thirst. The problem is a hungry ghost, a preta, has a neck, has a throat the size of a needle. Not even a grain of rice can get through this needle-like throat. So there's a way in which these hungry ghosts are just constantly desirous. And because they can't actually satiate themselves, they basically get really delirious. And in their delirium, they often imagine that they find piles of delicious food and they start trying to cram it into their face only to realize it's like feces or what have you. So it's like a really deluded, desirous, insatiable state of being. It's understood to be not as terrible as a hell realm because one has a certain level of autonomy, if you will. I mean, you, you, you are able to go up to this imaginary pile of food and willingly cram it into your mouth. So you have this kind of level of freedom. But again, you're plagued with this insatiable desire. Next up from that is the animal realm. And insofar as the hell realm, the ghostly realm, and the animal realm, insofar as those are considered lower rebirths, like below the human realm, the animal realm is as good as it gets as far as the lower rebirths go. And in general, the animals are basically yeah, I mean, the basic idea of being an animal in that way, it's about a kind of dull ignorance, a dull kind of, you know, just sort of being a very instinctual being, sort of just being about the basic necessities of life, just reproducing, eating, the basics. Then we get to the human realm, the realm in which we find ourselves. And then at the very top of this is the realm of the gods, the heavenly realm, where one basically can manifest whatever they want. And like in a dream, just have it. So quite a different life than a hungry ghost or a hell dweller. So that being the case, that this is kind of a spectrum. And it's a spectrum that goes all the way from hell to heaven. And Basically, just to kind of start to put this in Buddhist terms, if this by the and I'm putting this in Buddhist terms, but we're not talking about Buddhism yet. But in Buddhist terms, the lower births are all kind of about it's just dukkha, it's just pure suffering at, at greater and greater degrees. But it's dukkha. Even the animal realm is dukkha in that sense. As you move towards the heavenly realm and get into the human realm, you're now moving into the realm of sukha, bliss. Human beings are capable of divine, godlike bliss, and we are capable of hellish, hellish misery. It's the Goldilocks position of the human in this kind of worldview 
which is that a human knows hell and knows heaven, and therefore can, in a way, decide in that sense. Whereas animal realm, hungry ghost realm, hell realm are limited to the pure dukkha in that sense. And so, in the traditional worldview of reincarnation, the goal is to maximize sukha and minimize dukkha. The idea is, is that if you're reborn as a human, maximize sukha, which means improve your sukha, your bliss. So what I'm getting at is there's a kind of a very basic traditional way of thinking about reincarnation, which is basically what we in the West would call hedonism. Hedonism is about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, that that's the goal of life. That is the only goal of life, maximize pleasure, minimize pain. And now if we put that hedonistic view into the, the view of reincarnation, it's hedonism on a multi-life <laughs> scale meaning it's not just about maximizing my sukkah in this life. If I play my cards right, I could score the big sukkah and be reborn in an actual heavenly realm where dukkha is unheard of. It's pure sukkah. And so the whole project of karma the ideas of things that would affect your karma and cause you to be reborn as an animal or a hungry ghost or a hell dweller, the behaviors, the karma, the activities that would bring one down to the lower realms are to be avoided. And the, the activities, the karma that would increase my likelihood of being reborn in a heavenly realm, those are encouraged. And so what I want you to notice is that there is, of course, a sense of morality, a sense of a social contract, a sense of all the hallmarks of morality, but it's still under the guise of hedonism. It's still about maximizing one's pleasure. But the idea is, is that I should be nice to you because it'll maximize my pleasure in the next life. So there's that. <laughs> okay, um, really quickly, actually, I'm not even gonna introduce it. You may be familiar with there being six paths of rebirth. Often in Buddhism, they talk about the asuras, which are these uh, kind of almost, in some kind of perspectives, these are like demons. In others, they're like titans, demigods. The point is, though, is that they're part of the Deva family, except that they are understood to be very angry, very mean gods, <laughs> and not very nice, pleasant gods in that way. Basically, what they say is, is that Asuras suffer from anger, and Devas suffer from desire. But that's a Buddhist take on this. So just inserting that. Okay. So everybody feeling okay with the basics there, basic idea? Yeah, Tanya, perfect. I was just thinking, you know, for the lower realms, like if you were, you know, in hell or hungry ghosts or even animal, like how do you even have a chance? I mean, you know, in this old way. Oh my of gosh, things, I know. Like you're just so out of it. Like, I mean, if you're, you know what I mean? Like how can you even make any brownie points to like try to get you up to the next realm? Like, it yep. seems like once you're there, you're kind of screwed. It, it, indeed. And my, the, the reason why I wanted to tell you about that one hell where you keep grabbing the pole, it seems, it seems like it would never end. Like there would be no cause to ever get out of that situation. Um, yeah. In general, it said, in general, it is said that it takes a very, very rare soul to make it out of the hell realms 
and the hungry ghost realms. Whereas the animal realm, I mean, basically that's where most of us are coming from in that sense. So it's very easy to make it out of the animal realm. The basic idea though, is, is that it's a rare animal that actually, or not, it isn't a rare animal, but it would require an animal to be kind, to be gentle and not be too fierce in that way, which is tricky for animals because they're so instinctual, but it happens. And when they do, they make it to the human realm. By the way, on that note, since we're still doing kind of the more general basic view of this thing, I often am asked, I often hear the question, it's sort of about the idea of the, like the recycling of human souls in that sense. And this idea that if the, if the population keeps getting more and more and more, where are all the new people coming from? But again, they're, all, they're coming from the animal realm. They're coming from these other realms. And in general, it's kind of a giant process of coming to consciousness, by which I mean the grass is eaten by the cow and the grass thereby becomes conscious of itself. And that process of of consciousness getting more and more complex and more and more complex and continue. So basically what I'm saying is, is the blade of grass dies and becomes the flowers that die and become the trees that die and become the bugs that die and become the small animals that die and become the big animals that die and become us. So there's this giant up churning of consciousness in that way. And then once things start to get conscious, they can go up or down in that sense. They can slip back or they can move forward or just sort of bob up and down as a particular animal, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. By the way, Tony, your question is so important. I do want to mention, if you've ever heard of the Buddhist holiday in Japan, in Japan it's called Obon. It's called the Hungry Ghost Festival. Um, it's in fall. It's kind of like a Halloween type of a, um, a festival. And what they say is, is that it's a, that day is the only day of the year that merit and good activities can be transferred to the hell realms to affect the very limited possibility that Tanya mentioned or Tanya's question about doesn't it won't how could they ever get out of that well again traditionally in the buddhist tradition at least there's this one day a year that mm, there's a slim chance <laughs> in that way that a, a slim ray of light of the dharma can get down there so okay so before time gets too far <laughs> away let's start moving towards the buddhist view of this and then we'll get to our sutra so the Buddha comes along and now that I've told you all of this about reincarnation, it'll make probably a little bit more sense or something might make sense that one of, if not the great realization of the Buddha, well, the realization is called Anatman that there is no Atman. There is no soul or essence that's bobbing around throughout time and space, going through incarnation after incarnation after incarnation. There is no Atman. So what's going on then? If that's the case, right? Well, this is where it gets a little tricky with this whole Buddhist idea of no self or what is really technically no Atman, no soul or essence. So no journeyer going through all of these different paths of rebirth. So there's a few different ways to understand this from the Buddhist perspective. The earliest, oldest way to understand the Buddhist understanding of reincarnation without an Atman 
because the Buddhists still believe or understand, they still understand re things happening in terms of this cyclical death and rebirth. But it's but there's no Atman in that. So how does that work? What's going on then? From the earliest Buddhist point of view, the kind of so-called Theravada, Hinayana point of view, this situation right now that you're listening to, appearing human, speaking to other humans in that way, the idea is, is that this is the conditioned result of all of those prior, I dare call them lifetimes now. But the idea is, is that there is what I like to call a karma train. And it's this karma train where one action leads to another action, leads to another action, leads to another action. And like dominoes falling in that sense, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. The idea is, is that all of that past action has culminated in, in this, which would think it's a human, that's part of the conditioning, that would think, well, you know, that it's in this relationship to animals, in this relationship to gods. But the idea is, is that this is the conditioned result of all of that, with there not being any actual soul or essence there. Now, what I want you to kind of, what I want to do actually is I want to put this in a very, as clear as I can, because this is really delicate, tricky stuff. But, you know, if you've, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, this is really easy then, because you, you might have been here last week. If you, you remember Dharma doors last week, right? We talked about spiritual friendship. It was great. So that was last week. And if you've been coming for a while, you know, we met last the Sunday before that and the Sunday before that. And we've actually been meeting for a while. And the idea here is I can remember all of that. I can remember last week. I can remember two weeks ago. In fact, if I really think about it, I can remember a year ago, two years ago, three, four, five starts to get fuzzy, of course, the further back we go. But the point is, is that I can remember all the way back to basically elementary school. I even have vague memories from, you know, being a toddler and things like that. So here's the point of, of me mentioning all that. Buddhism teaches, the Buddha teaches that the concept of a self by which i mean by which the buddhist mean the idea that there's been an observer of my life between the ears behind the eyes that has been receiving all of these experiences that go that from a week ago, there's an idea that, that even though when I was a child, I was much smaller, didn't have a beard, didn't have long hair, actually didn't look a lot, you know, in terms of size, shape and all that. I didn't look like this. Yet I identify with that, like, I don't identify with that body, but somehow I feel like I, was between the ears and behind the eyes of that child, between the ears and behind the eyes of that adolescent, between the ears and behind the eyes of that guy last week, and hi, I'm between the ears and behind the eyes of this now. That's the feeling of a self, that there's been me there the whole time. And the Buddhist teaching of no self is that that is a, an illusion, a delusion. And what, it, what the delusion is, is this sense that I was I. The Buddhists call it the conceit, I. This I that was here last week, this I that was there. 
it, that's the I, that's the self that the Buddhists are saying is uh, a fabrication. It is nowhere to be found. Now, if you, and this wasn't supposed to be a Dharma talk about no self. So if you get that, if you understand, oh, wow, no self in that way. Okay. But I can still remember last week. I can still remember all of those other times. From a Buddhist point of view, it's actually an, a necessary part of the path to enlightenment that one becomes cognizant of one's prior rebirths. And if you're asking yourself, but how could that be if there's no Atman, there's no soul, there's no self? I suggest to you that by whatever miracle I can remember a week ago or a year ago or 10 years ago, by whatever miracle that I can remember that far back, the Buddhists are just saying, yeah, and you could keep remembering further back than that. But none of that is going to be the self. None of that is going to be the Atman. The reason why you can remember all of that is because that was all of the karma that led to this. So it's latent. All of that information, all of those lives are latent in every cell of your body, according to this early Buddhist view of, in that way. So there was a karmic samskaric, a conditioning relationship to the body and mind and sensations and all of that from a week ago, year ago, 10 years ago, two lifetimes ago, 10 lifetimes ago. That's the early Buddhist view of reincarnation. There is still basically this cyclical process of birth, death, life, and rebirth. There are the still five stations of rebirth, but there's no self or soul or atman in any of those sentient beings that's undergoing reincarnation because there is no self in that sense everybody follow me on that idea i mean again i know these things are complex <laughs> questions comments answers ideas that we don't okay uh, um you know, just quickly i <clears throat> I hadn't thought of it in this way, but because uh, I've heard the Dharma train, you know, idea that you that, that you've very skillfully uh, relayed to us, um, but it, it made me think of like, uh, you know, our remembered self is like, you know, whatever it is, it's like. Uh, you know, the sense that I was the same person then or that, you know, these events happened. And it leaves out, you know, a giant amount of happening for your consciousness. Like you can't, you can't do that as a as a human. It's just not possible. And it, it, uh, yeah, it fails to sort of honor the the actual experience moment to moment that we have lived through. It is like it, they're just two separate things. Not one is a small version. One is just a arbitrary version of a giant giant thing and um yeah a little, a little humbling to kind of the details that i'd like to pick out either in my favor or, or <laughs> so anyways that was that was really cool that mostly comment i guess all comment thanks mike respect appreciate it yeah tanya uh, that was really interesting and i don't feel that i quite got it like can you kind of either um i don't know um brendan like or or or, or michael like reiterate that because it, it sounded super interesting but i was like whoa what, what, what's going on brendan i mean i would give it to you but my idea was just sort of like you know if your karma is this like accumulation of your life the a lifetime let's say um you know we assume that ourself like when Michael, Michael was talking about like, kind of like, hey, I know that I'm a self because I'm the same consciousness from a kid and I can go through memories and I know what happened last week. You know, it's, it's just a fraction of, you know, the happenings of that lifetime that affect you in ways that are like, 
unknowable. You know, like we, we, we talk about conditioning and we think, well, my mom or my dad was away or whatever. Uh, and that's why X, Y, and Z, you know, you're leaving out a lot of other things that, uh, that you can't remember. And that you can't quite know. And if you take it into the past lifetimes, well, all bets are off. So, at least for me. It, it, uh, anyway, that's what that's that was what it occurred to me when he talked about it this time. Thanks for, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So that's really cool. Thanks for pointing that out. And then, does Buddhism then like kind of um, address why we sort of only look at certain, like you know? you know, like Brendan was saying, like, we, we can't, there's, we're looking at a slice of what happened. Yep. Not, not everything. Does, does, does Buddhism kind of address why that happens? Like we kind of have like tunnel vision. Oh, sure. Um, this is a, this will be, I'll, I'll work this in. Um, so uh, some of you have seen me do this before, but let me see. So if you imagine, and I'm going to do just a, a single lifetime version of this, but it's applicable to the more multi-life version as well. But for simplicity's sake, I, I want to just put it to you this way. So now I'm telling you the really, you know, the really Buddhist basic way of understanding this. So this is a blank sheet of paper. So let's say that this blank sheet of paper represents the sort of uh, proverbial tabla rasa, that clean slate of a newborn child. So the idea here is, is that if this clean shape, uh, piece of paper represents this pristine mind, well, the way to think about it is, and I have a, like a thing here, you can kind of think about it as conditioning, samskara, as being like these um, holes that get sort of um, punctured, if you will. And these holes are events. And the idea here is, is that some of these events are so insignificant that they barely they barely make uh, the slightest of holes a pinhole other events are a little more serious and so they make you know a nice good hole and then others you know a very traumatic event <laughs> P apologies so your life goes on and the mind is being exposed to event after event, after event, after event, after event, some big, some small, all of that. So this then is now perforated with you know, millions and millions and millions of some some scata conditioned conditionings. The analogy is, is you can imagine a kind of, see if I can do this kind of a light. No, it's not really going to work like I want. But the idea is you can imagine consciousness being like a light that's being blasted through all those samskara. And what you are witnessing right now is the conscious projection that matches all of the samskara of your past life. But the point is, is that now that I just told you that, that's another hole. And now that's the consciousness. And it's just a karma train of, of puncturing in that way. So that is where this present moment is. I often like to say this, you've been waiting your whole life for this moment because it has all culminated in this. I mean, I mean, you know, you get my point. But that's the idea. And now again, the idea is that this piece of paper, it goes back lifetimes, 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 lifetimes. And it's been 
punctured and punctured and punctured and punctured and punctured in so many infinite ways. And now this is the latest version in that sense. So you, you can see there's no room for a self there, but there is room for this experience. And explains how it is that this experience would be this experience in that sense. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful, perfect. Because uh, really quickly, by the way, too, in early Buddhism, I often like to point this out, in the Theravada and the early Buddhist tradition, reincarnation, well, and I, I, I basically should stop using that word at this point, but the cyclical process of birth, death, and rebirth, which is called samsara, that cycle is called samsara. The idea is, is that in early Buddhism, samsara and lifetimes did and do, they occur like literally when this body dies. Traditionally in Buddhism, the consciousness no longer bound to the physical body is now vibrating on an ethereal realm. This is called the bardo, this ethereal realm. It is disembodied. It is basically imagine like a free current of think of electricity, think of a think of a radio signal, a radio broadcast in between broadcast and antenna. So it exists, it's moving, but isn't uh, you know, intelligible, if you will, until it has been received by an antenna. So the idea is, is that that consciousness has a, a very tenuous existence at that point. It's basically riding pure memory, meaning samskara, like no physicality, just habitual energy. And then that moves into a womb and is reborn in uh, maybe as an animal or a human, or is reborn in heaven or what have you. My point is, is that in early Buddhism, the process of all of this that we're describing still happened lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. As you move into the more Mahayana Buddhist tradition, which the sutra that I might get to tonight, the, this sutra, reincarnation is understood to be very different. And what I mean by that is they basically talk about reincarnation happening either with every breath or with every thought moment, every thought moment. And the basic idea of that from a Buddhist point of view is that these five states of being, being in hell, being a hungry ghost, being an animal, being a human, or being a god, these are not, from a Mahayana Buddhist point of view, these are not physical incarnations in that they are not physical rebirths. To be a hell dweller, a hungry ghost, an animal, a human, or a god is a state of mind. And when one is in a particular state of mind, it looks like it crawls on all fours and is hairy, but that appearance, the appearance of looking that way from a Mahayana point of view is about the mental state, not the physical state. Does that make sense? So the reason why you might think I'm a human is because I'm acting like one. I'm speaking like one, I'm moving like one. And the reason why I think you all are human is because you're thinking, acting, talking like humans in that sense. And so from a Mahayana Buddhist point of view, when at any given moment, when one sort of starts to, you know, just sort of sit around, kind of eating, just kind of ruminating, in that thought moment, you could be actually reborn as an animal 
because you're not exercising your human capacity. You're devolving in that breath, in that thought moment into a state of an animal. It could get worse. You could get, become ravenously addicted to something to the point where you are insatiably hungry, roaming the streets in back alleys, desperate to get something that will never satisfy you. That's a state of mind. And that's being reborn as a hungry ghost. And one could be reborn in the hell realms as well, mentally speaking. So everybody follow me on, on that kind of subtle shift in the Mahayana. There's states of mind that then have kind of almost like mirage, phantom-like appearances, but because the state of mind is such. Okay. Yeah, Tanya. Um, a quick question, and if you don't want to go down this route, don't worry. But so, but there's there must, I mean, because like the Dalai Lama gets like re reincarnated, right? Yep. So, is there so is there other kind of? Well, let me tell you about the Dalai Lama a little bit. So, one of the practices of the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it's not a, really a practice I've ever seen in the Theravada. It's only in Mahayana, and it's very popular in the Vajrayana, particularly Tibetan Buddhism. I mentioned a, a, a little while ago the idea of the bardo, that um, intermit or that in that middle space between dying and being reborn. So that space is called the Great Bardo when one has died. And it can last up to 49 terrestrial days, which is why Buddhists tend to chant sutras for 49 days after somebody dies, because the idea is, is that if they, if they put that out in the ether, in that ethereal realm where that, that consciousness is traversing, it can soothe the mind state of that consciousness. And the basic idea is, is that when, when the mind in that sense becomes disembodied and is in the bardo, it can be real. This is, these are reports. I've never been there, or at least I don't remember the last time I was there. But the idea is, is that it can be very, very uh, traumatic, disturbing, causing all kinds of like, ah! And the idea is, is that minds or consciousnesses in that freaked out state tend to make bad decisions in terms of where they get reborn is the idea. And so there's a few things that you can do to prepare for that bardo. One of the things that you can do is in the Tibetan and Vajrayana traditions, you know, all of those scary looking flaming deities with like skull necklaces and like looking really scary. One of the ideas is you're going to encounter beings that look like that after you die. So if you've become acquainted to them now and you've gotten accustomed to seeing them now, when you go into the bardo, you'll be like, Yama, yo, what's up? I remember you. And you won't be as freaked out by their appearance. But if you've never seen them before, it's going to be startling. And if you think of rebirth as having all of these different paths, if you get freaked out, it's like, ah, and so you're kind of moving in this direction now and all of that. And there's one other thing that one can do to prepare for that bardo. What the Vajrayana tradition talks about is the little bardo. The little bardo is that state of being blacked out and unconscious in between waking and dreaming. So when you fall asleep, but haven't started dreaming yet, that's considered a bardo. And it's basically considered the practice bardo. We go there every night, we fall asleep, we black out, we find ourselves in a world that we mistake for this world. And so we 
go around trying to get stuff or we go around running away from stuff or whatever it is. So we are totally deluded, totally confused about being in a dream. And then we wake up <laughs> and it goes and it happens every night. So a Vajrayana practice is, uh, there are different techniques to do this, but the technique is to basically fall asleep, but maintain a subtle conscious awareness so that you are net, you don't fall completely asleep. And the, the, the goal, if you will, is to move directly into a dream state and not breaking your conscious awareness. It's difficult to do. Um, it, it, uh, it obviously it can be done in that sense, but it's a very, it's very difficult to not black out by which I mean, kind of fall asleep in that way. But the idea is, is that there's mantras and visualizations that you can kind of hold on to and then cruise right into a dream. And you will then in, you will basically be in a lucid dream at that point, because you will have not lost consciousness moving into it. So it'd be a lucid state. And then you would lucidly move out of that and wake up. The idea is, is that if you can get good at that, and what they say is, is that that is one of the bodhisattva practices to get good at that, so that when one passes away, one is trained and actually will not lose consciousness. And so we'll be able to cruise. And this will also mean that you've been acquainted with the images that you're going to see there. But upper level bodhisattvas are said to be able to will their specific rebirth. Whereas most of us are sort of up to the fate of our samskara, up to the fate of our past karma. And a big chunk of that samskara is about how we're going to respond to being in the bardo. So if you've created the necessary samskara, if you've created the necessary conditioning, you'll be able to move right through the big bardo and right into the proper uh, birth body that you would like to take on. One upper level major 10th stage bodhisattva who is able to do that is Avilokitishvara. The bodhisattva Guanyin, bodhisattva Avilokitishvara is capable of willingly moving through the bardo and entering a specific rebirth. And what they say in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, at least in certain sects of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, is that Avilokitishvara has willingly incarnated itself into our realm as the 14th Dalai Lama. So the idea is, is that that's Avilokiteshvara in disguise, who out of great compassion and great upaya appears like the most charming, smartest little Tibetan guy you probably ever would meet. So that's reincarnation regarding the Dalai Lama. Which, by the way, Tanya, that is an awesome question. Thanks. You have a follow-up? <laughs> well, then, so then it sounds like in the Mahayana and Vajrayana, you've got this sort of idea of like um, reincarnation into the realms, like from moment to moment to moment, as well as this reincarnation, like we're talking about right now through the Bardo and the Dalai Lama kind of thing. Yep. And for average, like non-Dalai Lama people. <laughs> yep. Um, We'd, we'd go through the bardo, maybe get freaked out and then get reborn somehow as well. Yep. So there's, so there's kind of like two levels of the um, reincarnation in Mahayana. Again, the, the, the moment to moment to moment, like breath or every thought, like you were saying, and then there's this, when you, your physical body dies kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And just, sure. Yep. And just from this Buddhist point of view, just keep in mind, there's no self doing all of that. It's just the samskara flowing into the samskara, flowing into the samskara. Okay, so that's all quite awesome. Um, let's see how far we get. 
actually, again, Tanya's question was awesome because it, it allowed me to say some things that are really going to make this even better. So we're going back to our lovely uh, Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra, in which the Buddha has been telling Shariputra about all of these different ways that a Bodhisattva can purify their Buddha land. And what we are up to now are these 10 qualities that if a Bodhisattva possesses these 10 qualities, they'll be able to basically purify their Buddha land. What 10, you may ask? They are, uh, yeah, I'll just read my translation. They're pretty much the same. The, you know, I'm working with a Tibetan version and a Chinese version. This is a situation where they're almost identical. So what are these 10? Well, a bodhisattva, upon hearing of the suffering of those in the hell realms, only give rise to great compassion for them and have no fear. Number two, hearing of the suffering of those in the animal realm, the bodhisattva only gives rise to great compassion and has no fear. Number three, hearing of the suffering of those in the realm of hungry ghosts. They only, the bodhisattva only gives rise to compassion for those beings and they do not have any fear. Number four, hearing of the decay of all the gods, the bodhisattva only gives rise to compassion and has no fear. Number five, hearing of hunger, famine, abuse, theft, hostility, and even murder. Among those in the, humans in the human realm, the bodhisattva only gives rise to great compassion and has no fear. Okay, let's stop there. That's halfway. So those are the first five qualities of this bodhisattva. Now, this language about hearing about the suffering of those beings hearing about the suffering of those beings, and then only giving rise to compassion for those beings. I, my feeling about kind of what they're talking about, and I mean, yeah, it's from what's about to come, but in that original old school version, not even the old school Buddhist version, but the older, just original Hindu traditional Indian view of reincarnation, samsara, when I said that the whole name of the game was about getting out of dukkha and maximizing sukha, so minimizing suffering and, and increasing, maximizing bliss. When people think that way, the idea is, ah, oh, that sucks to be in the hell realm. I don't want to be in a hell realm. That's terrible. It's not, there's no compassion for those who have been there. It's this very selfish sense of, I don't want to be ruined there. I better do stuff. To, so I'm not born in a hell realm because a hell realm is terrible. In a way, that's how kind of a normal person might respond to hearing about the suffering of those in the hell realm. The Bodhisattva gives rise to great compassion for all those be hearing about those beings grabbing that hot iron pole the bodhisattva has compassion for those beings like tanya tanya your question was pure bodhisattva when you asked well then how would those hell dwellers get out of that situation that was uh, from my understanding that's a question out of compassion that's a total question of well that sucks how can we get them out that's what the Bodhisattva thinks. Not how can I avoid being born there, but actually is concerned about those who are already born there. Same with the realm of the hungry ghosts. Same with the realm of the animals. 
And then this interesting note about the hearing of the decline of the gods. So I'm going to uh, make a decision now to do this section in two parts. So we're going to do an, uh, the, the next five qualities we'll do next week, because I don't want to rush this. So this is a really interesting idea. It pertains a lot to what I was talking about earlier in terms of the idea of maximizing sukha and minimizing dukkha. It has to do with what this text calls the decline of the gods. Let's see. Yeah, and same in the Tibetan. It's about this idea of the decline or the decay of the gods. So what I'm about to tell you or what I'm about to kind of summarize is kind of all kind of come from this beautiful little Buddhist poem. The poem is called the, the uh, what was it called? The San, Sandara Nanda, the handsome Nanda. It's by Ashvagosha. Ashvagosha is a very, very, very famous Indian poet, in, by some people's estimations, Ashvagosha is the greatest Indian poet who happens to be a Buddhist monk, who happens to write a bunch of Buddhist poetry. But I, I want you to know that this person, Ashvagosha, is famous in literary circles for writing amazing Sanskrit poetry. He was a Buddhist monk, he wrote a lot of treatises, and he wrote this beautiful poem called The Handsome Nanda. Nanda, not Ananda, not the Buddha's young cousin Ananda. Nanda is another cousin of the Buddha. But Nanda is the beautiful, handsome Nanda. And the story of, of the handsome Nanda is, it's this beautiful story about Nanda. He's, he's married. He, he's married to this beautiful woman. And it all starts, the poem starts, and they're painting bindis on each other's foreheads. The, the little dots that kind of show that you're in a relationship with somebody. So they're painting these bindis on each other. And Nanda hears that the Buddha, his cousin, is in town. And he feels like he should go say hi. And his wife is like, no, basically, we're, we were about to make love. Like, you don't, don't leave me right now. And he says this beautiful line. He says, I'll be back before your bindi dries. And so he goes and runs to say hi to his uh, cousin, the Buddha. And basically, the Buddha, and it, it's an interesting story, but the Buddha convinces Nanda to become a monk. <laughs> and let's just say he, he doesn't make it back in time uh, before the bindi dries. And so he goes and becomes a monk. He just jets. He just leaves his wife. And... Basically, what happened was, is that, um, yeah, I'm going to, I need to paraphrase this. It's so interesting. But Nanda, he heard about how meditators can go to these heavenly realms where the, the goddesses in that realm make his wife look like a goat. And so he basically is like, really? Well, then I want to meditate. I want to get into one of those heavenly realms. And so he becomes a monk and he's doing the practice, but he, it eventually comes out that he has made this vow to like do the practice and basically even to be celibate in this life in order to be reborn in that heavenly realm. So this goes on for a while until eventually word gets out that 
Nanda is doing all of this for the wrong reasons. And so I forget who it is. I actually think, uh, I don't think it's the Buddha. I think it's one of the monks. I haven't read it for a while, but one of the monks actually takes Nanda up to the heavenly realms. And there's a lot about sexuality. This, the, this poem is interesting because it's about somebody who basically has everything, beautiful wife, big home, money, all of this stuff. And so there's like very little impetus to seek enlightenment because basically Nanda has maximized sukha, he's maximized bliss. When he hears about more bliss, he says, oh, well, then this is not bliss at all and wants the more bliss. So he's kind of representative of that early Hindu way of thinking is what I'm getting at. Now, when he gets up to the heavenly realm, he, he learns a lot up there. But the one thing that he learns is about the decay of the gods. And the basic point of the decay of the gods you can kind of think about it like mythologically or symbolically. Mythologically, what they're talking about is, um, yeah, within the realm of Buddhism, if um, basically before the Buddha, it was understood that if you made it to a heavenly realm, you were, you're good. Like you're, you won't, um, fall back down into the lower realms anymore. Like was a generally understood idea that if you made it up to the realm of a God or even as a God, there was no more coming back to the mundane world. What Nanda learns is that even the gods over enough time eventually do descend back into the worldly realm. And basically, Nanda has this realization about the futility of the pursuit of wealth and sensual pleasures in that way. He thought if he made it there, that that was going to be it. And I, I mentioned a moment ago that you can read this mythologically. Mythologically is the idea that even after thousands and thousands of years, gods, even gods, fall back into the realm of humans and might even fall back into the realm of animals and so on. That's mythologically. More symbolically, the way that I read a, a text like this and the, the way that I read the idea of the decline or the decay, decay of the gods, I read that as we all know this. I think we all know this. We have a sense that if I had more wealth or more money or more power or more whatever, that I would be happier, that it would be more blissful of a, of a life. And I think we all know that, uh, what did Biggie say? Mo money, mo problems, right? So the idea is, is that we know that some of the most anxious, suffering people are the wealthiest. And that's what Nanda realizes, is that that pursuit of pleasure in that way, it's totally futile. It's totally a, a like, it's not actual bliss. And so at that moment, he actually has the real realization and, be and becomes a kind of a monk for real in that way. So the idea is, is that the Bodhisattva hearing about that decline of the gods has compassion for them. So that would be like hearing of a very, very wealthy, powerful person's troubles. And rather than being like, ha, sucker, actually being, feeling compassion for that person. Really, truly, that would be the bodhisattva move.
upon hearing of the decline of the gods. And then, of course, the last of these was the human realm and hearing of all of the terror and the wars and the illnesses and all of the things having compassion for all beings. And of course, all five of these included the idea of having no fear. And no fear, I want to actually, I, yeah, the sutra doesn't really say it. So I'm going to mention it. There's a kind of a thing in the Bodhisattva path. Again, it's kind of a mythological thing, or you can, you can hear this mythologically, but it's about the a Bodhisattva who has mastered the practice that I mentioned to Tanya's uh, question, the practice of basically being able to not lose consciousness after death and the ability to skillfully navigate one's rebirth. Well, a bodhisattva, again, mythologically speaking, it may be that a bodhisattva willingly takes rebirth in a hell realm, willingly takes rebirth in the realm of hungry ghosts, willingly takes rebirth in the animal realm. And they do that out of compassion for the beings in those realms. And what I want you to notice is, is that all the way up until this moment, almost like this moment, everything that we've been talking about in terms of samsara, in terms of reincarnation, even that early Buddhist way, it was all about escaping hell, hungry ghost realm, even the human realm, like Nanda learned, even escaping the desire to be reborn as a god in that way. So all the way up until this point, even including Buddhism, the goal was to have nothing to do with not just the lower rebirths, but any of the rebirths. But the Bodhisattva now, out of compassion, may willingly take on rebirth in the hell realm. And the reason why I'm saying this is what allows a bodhisattva to do that? Well, many things allow them to do that, but they have no fear of that hell realm. They have no fear of ghostly realms. They have no fear of animal realms, no fear of human realms, no fear of godly realms. So the idea is that most of us, upon hearing about the hell realms, would be afraid of such a thing. I would never want to go anywhere near it and would normally want to maximize our bliss. But then if we learn the Dharma, we could access Nirvana in that sense and have like the true everlasting bliss in that way. But again, a Bodhisattva sort of postpones that ultimate bliss of Nirvana and out of virya, out of determination, willingly goes into the lower rebirths to save sentient beings, as they say. So questions, comments, answers, ideas about those first five things of the Bodhisattva, hearing about all the suffering, being compassionate, having no fear. Cool. Then the reason why I'm pausing here is because the next five of these they begin to introduce the actual idea of the Bodhisattva's pure land. And it's such an important idea because of course, that's what we've been, that's what we've been doing. That's what we've been reading about is how to purify our Buddha land in that way. And so we've been learning about all these different qualities, but the next five, what we'll talk about next week is it's gonna really, introduce pure land buddhism so like next week is pure land buddhism for real for real so if you've ever heard of that or wanted to know more come back next week 
Uh, and that's going to be it for me for this evening. Thank you all so much, as always.